No, so thank you very much, and we are very uh, pleased to be here. And what we'd like to do in the next uh, 35 minutes or so is to let you know some of the things that um, are happening in the field of cancer. Uh, we're going to be talking on some of the initiatives that we have undertaken at Memorial Sloan Catering at Cancer Center uh, here in New York, but um, this applies to the whole to the whole field, and it's quite and it's quite exciting. So, I'm just going to give you uh, a brief introduction. But we have uh, two great uh, panelists today here. On my left is Barry Taylor. He is um, the inaugural member of a new service. Uh, at Memorial Sloan Catering is the computational oncology uh, service. And then um, uh, further down, we have Pedram. Pedram is a clinical research fellow, but he's going to be on the faculty come July. And Pedram is working um, and leading a, a lot of um, uh, very important studies in the field of uh, genomics. So just to start, um, as, as we have been able to learn over the last decade or so. Uh, cancer is a disease of the genome. Um, every single cell that we have has 20,000 genes. And when things go wrong, when some of the genes acquire um, uh, alterations, genomic mutations or deletions or other uh, gain of function uh, or loss of function uh, roles, that's when cancer occurs. Over the last decade, uh, you've been familiar with the Human Genome Project and the project to sequence every single cancer type. And today, we have information of all the landscape of genomic alterations that are present in every type of cancer. What we are now is in a different moment. Today, we have, for the first time, the capacity to look at the genomes of the tumors of our patients as part of our routine uh, care. And one thing that we have launched a memorial is the effort to sequence the genome of every tumor from every single patient that has advanced disease. And we are learning that every patient and every tumor is different. We don't have two tumors that are identical. Imagine the amount of computational work that is required to be able to analyze and provide clinical significance to all the mutations that we can detect in the patient's tumors. And then what's incredibly exciting is that we have a system by which we can map the specific genomic alterations that we see in a given tumor to a whole set of new and exciting therapies that we are uh, developing. Uh, we have uh, opened over 800 clinical trials. We um, offer clinical trials to many of our patients and they benefit from them, many of them do. And these are very smart clinical trials with therapies that are precisely uh, addressing and precisely directed against the genomic alterations that we are uh, trying to uh, target. So this is what has been called uh, uh, the Precision Medicine Initiative. You've heard this word. And basically, it's just matching the features of the tumor to the therapies that are particular to each case. It's a tremendous undertaking that it's in place. Now, on top of that, uh, tumors evolve, and they evolve rapidly. They follow uh, Darwinian principles, so that under selective uh, pressure by therapy, evolution happens, and we are beginning to develop ways to monitor tumor evolution in real time um, by looking at the presence of tumor DNA in blood. So uh, this is the promise of the liquid biopsy. You've heard about that as well. I will give you some, some, some details on what we are doing. So again, tumor sequencing real time, clinical trials with new therapies, new combinations, tumor monitoring, and then, of course, um, uh, trying to see how the tumor evolves. So that's, in a nutshell, what we do. Uh, we are anticipating that by doing this, we're going to be able to bring new therapies much faster to the clinic. And as a matter of fact, we are already doing this. We are accelerating the pace 
of new treatments being brought to our patients. So, Barry, why don't you um, talk to us about yourself a little bit and what you do and what is your take on the whole initiative that's on the way? Sure. Um, so my name is Barry Taylor. Um, I'm a computational biologist by training. Um, I, got, I started my training at the University of Michigan and finished it actually at Weill Cornell here in New York. Um, I started my lab at UCSF um, and then a few years later moved to Sloan Kettering, which is just about a year and a half ago. Um, and I, I call myself a computational biologist by training, um, and that's an important distinction. I think what we are, our cancer biologists, our computational oncologists, where computational tools are just one of many tools that we use to address um, the, the questions that we're interested in. Um, and um, at, in part of my role, in addition to my laboratory, I'm an associate director for a new center for molecular oncology at MSKCC that's really designed to catalyze much of um, the precision oncology that Jose was just describing. And so in my lab, um, we're extremely interested in developing new analytical tools to make sense of the enormous amount of data uh, that Jose just referred to. So instead of thinking about big data as an esoteric basic science problem, which it certainly is, the question is how do we bend the curve of that data for the benefit of individual patients because that's what we're acquiring at the point of care now um, in patients at Sloan Kettering. And so my lab and the, and the Center for Molecular Oncology is very strongly focused on trying to take um, the skills we have in computer science, in mathematics, in statistics, um, in genomics to make sense of all of this data. And by that I mean not to improve the area under the curve by a little bit. I mean, we're really talking about trying to distinguish in mutations that we've observed in patients who are alive at our hospital today, which ones are the ones that are biologically and clinically significant and which ones are the ones that aren't. And that's a critically important distinction about which we really don't know a lot. Um, we really have a really great understanding of a very small number of mutations, and we really have a very terrible and poor understanding about the vast majority of what we're witnessing in our patients' genomes. Um, and this isn't, as I mentioned, an intellectual exercise. We have um, already used these kinds of approaches, these analytical approaches, to identify what we think to be completely novel, very interesting mutations that it, it, it sort of don't pass go, don't collect your $200, those patients are getting directly enrolled in clinical trials on the basis, on the strength of what might be just in silico data, a computational prediction that we're also validating simultaneously uh, experimentally. And so that is what's called a co-clinical trial. And what's great about that is that the computational biologists in my lab or the computer scientists in my lab are having a direct impact on patient care. And we can see that those mutations, if they validate, and by that I mean if the patient who has that mutation responds to the very specific and targeted therapy, um, then that's a clinical hypothesis. That's, that's tremendous validation data and something we've never been able to do in computational biology before and in genomics. And that's why I think we're sort of moving towards the concept of computational oncology um, to foster a group of scientists who have deep quantitative skills but can marry that with a really nuanced understanding of cancer biology, um, cellular, molecular genetics, um, as well as scientists who also really understand um, in a very explicit way the clinical challenges that somebody like Jose or Pedram face in the clinic and for their patients. And it's really the, the group of people who can um, have a fluency in all three of those fields that I think is really gonna define a new era of, of, of computational sciences that can direct patient care. Um, and so that's at least some of what we're doing, and um, we're very much involved, uh, my laboratory and the center in, at large, in understanding which mutations confer sensitivity and resistance to these therapies, and of course understanding how these patients are evolving. And I think it's a very interesting intellectual question to understand how do these tumors evolve from an ancestral cell. Um, I think our challenge is something slightly different, which is to say how are these tumors evolving after we've diagnosed them? When we add a therapy or we perform surgery on our patients, we've added an exogenous selective pressure. It's changing the fitness landscape in an interesting way, and we're driving those tumors down evolutionary trajectories that we can start to understand with longitudinal characterization, uh, with sequencing, um, a, a better understanding of the mechanism of action of these drugs, 
and a really good understanding of tumor biology. And I think that's the sort of transformative moment we're in where we can <coughs> use that information to intercede earlier with an expectation, a prediction of how that patient's disease will evolve. We can tailor re uh, therapeutic responses, therapeutic interventions up front to forestall that process. And so that's who we are, and that's um, what we do in our role at the center. Thank you. So before uh, I give the word to, to Pedro, just to give you um, an example on the mechanics of this, how all this works. Uh, all our patients with um, advanced disease are automatically being offered to participate in this sequencing. Uh, we are sequencing every year now 10,000 10, tumors. So imagine the amount of data that we have. Um, this uh, data is analyzed. It goes into a system. And then we have about an army of 40 physicians, scientists, computational guys that they provide clinical annotation to the findings that are found in that particular tumor. So if you know you find a mutation of a gene called BRAF, we have people that provide clinical annotation. It explains what it is, uh, what does it mean, and so on. And then automatically uh, we have our clinical trials and we have a system that automatically if a patient is eligible for a clinical trial based on the genomic uh, finding, automatically uh, we send an email to the treating physician and we say, you know, dear Dr. Pasalga, dear Dr. Rosavi, uh, the patient of yours has this mutation that makes them, makes him or her eligible for that particular therapy. And then um, if we see a response, uh, we, we see that the patient benefits from that in his lab and in other labs, we functionally characterize what is going on and try to understand what defines that. Um, before I give the microphone to Pedram, just I'm going to give you one example on how this works. Um, there is a very, there is a very um, frequent mutation in melanoma called BRAF, but it is also present in very low frequency in a number of tumor types, and it's present in very rare tumors. So uh, work that we had done identified that the disease that is incredibly rare is called edham chester disease. It's kind of a lymphoma. It's a disease that involves, affects the brain, the bones, the skin. Uh, there is no therapy for this disease. Patients died from it. Very rare, 200 cases a year in the US. But we found through this sequencing that 60% of these patients harbored this mutation on BRAF. So when we began to identify this pattern, we immediately reached out to these patients and we offered them this uh, therapy. Um, we have treated now about 15, 16 patients. Every single one of these patients, the tumor is gone. And these were patients with brain metastasis. These are patients that had bony disease. So we are building these stories one at a time uh, through the power of computational oncology. And also, our physicians that are in clinic, uh, they can look at the computer and they can uh, analyze the genome of their patient. They, they, they can know what's going on. And they also can click and they can find out how many other tumors have similar mutations and what has happened to those, to those patients. So it's incredibly uh, useful uh, for the day-to-day -day care. But anyway, Pedro, why don't you tell us two things um, about your clinical trials and then uh, about this concept that is incredibly exciting, which is the concept of the liquid biopsies. we are identifying a lot of these mutations that we have drugs for. And then uh, we need to figure out how to enroll these patients in the trials because these are the mutations that happen in a very small percentage of the patients. So in 1%, 2% of the patients, we have this mutation, but we have a very good drug for, but this drug is not approved for this, for this type of disease. So the concept that's what's introduced in Memorial Sloan Kettering is the concept of basket trials. So instead of giving the patients with breast cancer and just enrolling patients with breast cancer in a clinical trial, we are saying patients who have BRAF mutations, we 
600E, they come to this uh, basket trial and all of them are being enrolled in this clinical trial. And then what's happening is that we, it gives us the option and the uh, potential to treat a lot of these potentially curable uh, mutations, uh, uh, treatable mutations through these basket trials. So there are a lot of these basket trials happening. The point is that the patients are responding to treatment. At some point, the patients stop responding to treatment. What happened with solid tumors, the way to look at the genome of the tumor is just by getting a biopsy of the tissue, we get a biopsy from the tissue before treatment, we get a biopsy during the treatment, and we get a biopsy after treatment. A lot of pain for the patients. It's not easy to get these biopsies, some risk with the biopsies. So what happening now is that we are looking into, we learned in the past 10, 20 years that the tumor, when they die, they release a small amount of their DNA into the bloodstream. Uh, and these small fragments of the DNA just float in the blood and then just, uh, they, they get uh, uh, secreted out of the body through the urine or through the liver. Uh, what we've learned that through sequencing of these tumors, we can get a good picture of what's happening in the genome of the tumor. So probably instead of going and biopsying every single one of these tumors to see if they're responding, why they're not responding after the treatment stop responding, we can actually monitor the disease through these uh, liquid biopsies and blood samples uh, why the patients are being treated. So the concept that was introduced is the uh, concept of liquid biopsies, looking at the genomic of the DNA through uh, blood and also the DNA of the uh, tumor through blood. And for this, it's just a huge uh, potential here. Uh, we can monitor the disease to see if, the, as, a, as a potential, to see if the patient is responding, not responding. But we can go beyond that. We can look at the genomic of the tumor to see how the tumor is evolving. Tumor has multiple mutations. We look at the mutations throughout the therapy, and we see that some of these mutations are going up. The frequency of these mutations in the blood are going up, some of them are going down. We can monitor this and learn about the resistant clones or the clones that are not responding to treatment through multiple liquid biopsies throughout the therapy. And then this gives us some idea about uh, the resistance to the treatments and how we deal with these treatments. Yeah. So although the concept of uh, looking at DNA of the tumor in blood is not a new concept, it's something that was proposed 10 years ago, uh, the technology was not there because, um, so basically about one third of the tumor DNA is being shed into the blood. Uh, the tumors are well vascularized, so they shed DNA all the time. Now, the blood is full of normal DNA, of course, so it's like looking uh, a needle into haystack, so to speak, it is. But today, the technology of sequencing, next-gen sequencing, is so powerful that you can go 100,000 deep. So you can sequence every single molecule 100,000 times, and then there is no, and you can go also broad, so you can sequence uh, uh, many, many genes, and basically, there is, no, there is no escape, right? If there is tumor that belongs, if there is DNA from the tumor in the blood, we will pick it up. So then the promise here is not only that we can follow how the tumor is evolving, and Pedro mentioned something that is very important, uh, the tumor is heterogeneous. There are multiple clones, and maybe if you treat with one particular therapy, one clone will emerge. It is purely uh, Darwinian, is the survival of the, of the fetus, right? But also, something that we are very excited is that we think we can use this technology for the first time to diagnose cancer very early on. Um, many people are putting lots of emphasis in the concept of cancer prevention. And yes, we can prevent many cancers. So if we don't smoke, if we don't drink, if we don't eat, uh, <laughs> you know, we're going to live... We'll be we, hungry. We're going to live longer. And also, it, would, it will feel like much longer. Uh, it's going to be both. Uh, but even if we do all these things, okay, and, and we would not do all these things, uh, you, can, you can 
um, reduce the frequency of cancer, the incidence of cancer, by, say, 40% on a good day. Uh, cancer is a little bit the result of bad luck in that we have tissues that are dividing so frequently that errors can accumulate and cancer may occur. If this is the case, and I think that's the case at least for a proportion of cancers, the concept that we are going to prevent cancer is going to be one that we cannot achieve. So if we cannot prevent cancer, then the next best thing is to intercept cancer at the very early stage, when things begin to occur, when that cancer is so small that you do not see it in any kind of diagnostic test. Today, we have in place mammographies, and we have in place the prostate exams, and we have colonoscopies. Well, let me tell you, and CAT scans uh, of the chest, let me tell you, mammographies have both poor sensitivity and poor specificity. Um, in 60% of the times, mammographies are wrong. So uh, we have women that undergo their yearly mammography. The chances that a woman will have a biopsy of the breast for a false positive image uh, is almost guaranteed in the period of 10 years. So again, it's a... So I think that this technology might enable us to diagnose cancer at a stage where we can really cure it. And tumors that we cannot cure, such today, such as pancreas cancer, we cannot cure pancreas cancer because by the time it's diagnosed, it's so advanced, you know, this is an organ that is all the way in the back in the abdominal cavity. By the time we diagnose it, by the time patients have symptoms, it's too late. It's game over in many cases. Imagine that we could diagnose pancreas cancer at the very early stage, where the tumor has only one centimeter. We would cure the majority of pancreas cancer. So anyway, so that's another, another application uh, that we, would, we think that we'll be able to bring to the population this test that will change uh, in full the concept of screening uh, in the years to come. And we're very, very excited. Um, I'd like to switch a little topic to something that Barry has been leading, which is the concept of tumor evolution uh, under therapy. And something that many of you have been aware of is that sometimes you have a patient that has cancer, the patient receives the initial therapy, uh, they do well, eventually the tumor comes back, and then there is nothing you can do. Uh, Barry, maybe you can tell us your efforts in glioblastoma and other tumors and, and teach us what's happening with the tumors, how they evolve and what's happening to them. Sure. So I think a lot of what we've talked about today is to measure the genomes of patients largely once. So they come in, they're diagnosed through conventional means and through a biopsy and genome sequencing, um, and then you design a therapeutic course and we're on our way. Um, I think some of the things that we're starting to understand is that we need to be monitoring these patients longitudinally with these kinds of technologies. And the question is, how are mutations changing and why? And so um, we have uh, recently been studying gliomas, so, so brain tumors, and brain tumors are a very heterogeneous disease. Um, the very worst, um, the most ominous of which are stage four, what are called glioblastomas, and patients will live with a glioblastoma for about a year to 18 months, but uh, mortality is extremely high. Um, there are also lower grade versions of the disease, uh, lower grade gliomas, and those patients do better. Um, with surgery, many of those patients can live seven or eight years, but every single one of them will eventually relapse. And we don't know why, and we cannot predict which ones will. And so we were very interested in that problem. Um, obviously, there's been a lot of characterization of glioblastomas, which is, of course, the most insidious version of that disease. And those patients do benefit uh, marginally so from a drug called temozolomide um, that is uh, a mutagen, uh, a mutagenic agent. But lower grade gliomas haven't enjoyed the same level of understanding. And we got very interested in this problem of can we predict, can we understand which patients are more likely to eventually recur 
um, many of those patients will recur um, with what we'd call progressive disease. They've had what we consider a malignant progression. They may have been diagnosed back in, say, 2007 with a grade two glioma and had surgery. Um, they may not even have, have gotten radiation. They may not have gotten chemotherapy. And seven years later, they come back to the hospital um, with a recurrence, and now it's stage four glioblastoma, and our options are extremely limited. Other patients will relapse within a year. Other patients will relapse with the same grade of disease they were originally diagnosed with. And we really have absolutely no understanding of what mediates that process. And so we have been um, profiling um, cohorts of these patients longitudinally. And so by that I mean we have a primary tumor that was resected at the time of their diagnosis. And then those patients are followed. And those patients are gonna get the standard of care therapy that they might get, and then they might recur. And at the time of their recurrence, they're gonna have a, a second surgery. And we're gonna take a piece of that tumor and we're gonna sequence it again. And then some of those patients might be sent home and they may do okay for a while, but then they may have a second relapse of their disease. And they have a little surgery or a brain biopsy, we get a piece of tissue and we sequence it again. And we have uh, now a fairly nice, sizable cohort of patients we've really followed longitudinally and now we can compare with all of the tools that Jose just mentioned, the mutational profiles of these patients over time. What is present at relapse that wasn't present at diagnosis? What might be present at relapse for patients who had a malignant progression that's not present in patients who didn't have a malignant progression but still recurred? How do we use this information to understand this evolutionary process happening after their initial diagnosis? And one of the things that we found that was quite interesting is a subset of lower grade gliomas that um, will also be treated after their surgery with that same drug I mentioned, temozolomide, which in glioblastomas has been shown to lead to a, a, an improvement in outcome and in mortality. Um, that's not been shown in lower grade gliomas, but of course there aren't a lot of uh, therapies available to glioma patients, certainly not the, the armament of targeted therapies that we know are, are working quite well in, in, a, in a myriad solid tumors. And so, Gliomas are really an intractable recalcitrant disease. It's a very, a very challenging problem. But in a subset of the patients who had gotten temozolomide after their initial surgery, those patients actually, at the time of their relapse, um, had the, the, the therapy will, event, will be effective initially. Um, it will start killing cancer cells. Um, it may only leave behind a small number of cancer cells. But at, at the time of their relapse, when you compare those two tumors, the pretreatment and the post-treatment tumor, the post-treatment tumor now has thousands of brand new mutations we've never seen before that were not present at the time of diagnosis. And you're probably thinking to yourself, well, I mentioned that was a mutagenic chemotherapy. Maybe it's not totally surprising that a patient's relapse that's now drug resistance, uh, drug resistant, will have mutations introduced by that chemotherapy. The problem, so that's not an unexpected problem per se, but the problem that we saw was in every single one of those hypermutated patients, in 100% of them, they had a malignant progression to glioblastoma at the time of their relapse. And so now we get into the hard problem of, well, let's start sifting through those mutations, thousands of them in individual patients, and say, is there a causative reason for that malignant progression? And in every single one of those patients, a therapy-induced mutation Right? This is a tumor that initially responded to this drug, but then stopped responding, and the drug started to introduce mutations, and that clone grew out, again, in an, evolu in an evolutionary sense. It's now a fitter clone, because it has all these additional mutations. Some of those mutations hit codons, parts of proteins that we've known for years are driver mutations in cancer, are activating mutations. And so now, in that patient who had a malignant progression to disease, after they got temozolomide, and after temozolomide induced catastrophic hypermutation that was not present at the time of diagnosis, temozolomide introduced now a mutation that activated a molecular signaling pathway that was quiescent at diagnosis. And so what in the world did we do with that drug? Is it possible that we put a therapy in a patient that potentiated their malignant progression to more intractable disease that would never have happened in the first place had we treated them with standard of care surgery and radiation? And we know those patients will survive many years with such therapy, right? So this is what we're trying, this is what we're really working very hard to understand. How is it when we intercede? Of course, we all are incredibly gratified by the 
um, Erdheim-Chester example, where you put a targeted therapy in that targets the mutant protein you observed in the patient, and the patient does phenomenally well. And it is extremely gratifying and a wonderful model of precision oncology. But the reverse is also true. These are still clinical hypotheses and scientific hypotheses um, that we're testing in the clinic. This is where science, basic science and translational and clinical medicine come together. The boundaries between those fields aren't so cut and dry anymore. And so we're, we're testing hypotheses in patients. And they don't always work out, but when they don't work out, they may be teaching us something fundamentally important about the events that drive progressive disease. And now we can think about how we intercede in alternative ways very early on. And so I think what we're trying to do is really inject as much basic science, as much uh, computational interpretation. It, there's, there's really a problem of, you mentioned needles in a haystack, it's really needles among needles. It's an interpretation problem. We've gotten extremely good at measuring stuff and detecting stuff with many hundreds of thousand fold next generation sequencing, very unbiased. What we really are still pretty terrible at is interpreting what it means. Right? And these kinds of studies, these kinds of controlled studies where you have something to compare to, right? that pretreatment tumor, and you're watching patients over time, is an extremely powerful model to start capturing the complexity here, understanding it, preventing it, interceding in it. Um, it it's, it's really a very exciting time, I think, from that perspective. Yeah, thank you. Uh, let me uh, bring another topic that I think is the other side. So we were talking that some specific mutations uh, lead to choosing some specific therapies that are very good for that particular set of mutations. But as Barry um, is mentioning, uh, you have, um, we have all the time tumors that uh, harbor thousands of mutations, you know? So it looks like an impossible task. If you have a tumor that has hundreds and thousands of mutations, um, what we were concerned is how on earth are we going to develop therapies? I mean, where do you start? How do you do it? And something that has happened in the last, I would say, three, four years that is incredibly exciting is that um, you've heard about the immune therapies. Have you all heard about the immune therapies uh, in, in cancer? Um, so in the last two or three years, uh, a number of therapies have been developed that basically what they do is that they awaken the, our immune system, they awaken our lymphocytes, and then these lymphocytes recognize the cancers as, as, uh, as foreign because they have so many mutations that they realize that those cells do not belong. Another tremendous field of discovery, therefore, is to try to identify which are the predictors of response to immune therapies. Just to give you perspective, immune therapies are working incredibly well against melanoma, against non-small cell lung cancer, against head and neck tumors, against Hodgkin's disease, against bladder cancer, and against um, uh, I'm missing one, uh, small cell lung cancer. Uh, so it's not, it's not trivial. Uh, these therapies will change the way we do things. So Barry or uh, Pedro, can you talk about how are we going about this to try to identify who will respond to immune therapies? So um, this is a wicked hard problem. Um, it is extremely satisfying and a totally predictable outcome that a patient with a thousand mutations, by random chance alone, some of those mutations are going to create neoantigens that the immune system can recognize. And that that will happen more often, it's a lot of large numbers, that will happen more often in those patients than it will happen in a patient with, say, a breast cancer, which might have 30 mutations in the same amount of genomic territory that one of these other patients might have 1,000. The problem is, what precisely is a neoantigen? What, which mutations are immunogenic? And that is an extraordinarily hard computational challenge. Um, it is an extraordinarily hard experimental challenge. And what you want to be able to do is move beyond these patients. Uh, these, what we'd consider to be hypermutated patients, really account for I would say between two and a half and three percent of all human cancers diagnosed in, say, the United States. And there are subsets of cancer types where there are also not hypermutated patients, say endometrial or colon cancers. 
Um, and so the question, I think a really important question is how do we start to recognize these and then how do we make that inference in all of the patients that aren't hypermutated? Because it will be the case that there might be a very small subset of breast cancers, a very small subset of prostate cancers, none of which have a very high mutational burden that through random chance or otherwise have a mutation that created a neoantigen, it created an immunogenic peptide, an immunogenic protein that the immune system recognizes. And now we can expand the population of patients to whom we give immunotherapy. And whereas immunotherapy is not technically a very targeted therapy at all, we can actually render those patients directly targetable by understanding that. And so I think it's an enormous computational challenge and there's been a tremendous amount of algorithmic development over time to, to really predict what these are um, because we want to be able to extend this therapy to patients beyond those that we can observe hypermutation, which is admittedly pretty rare. But there are going to be a not inconsiderable number of human cancers out there, patients diagnosed with low mutational burden disease for which they have one or two of these that the immune system would otherwise recognize and we simply can't identify them now, right? So this is a tremendous computational problem. We have to build high throughput experimental systems to test algorithmic predictions of what is an immunogenic mutation. Um, this is how we're eventually going to learn how to do this right. Thank you very much. And I have one last question. I know the time is short, but I have one last question uh, and one comment from Petra. Um, we have been working very closely uh, with the White House and with the Vice President's office about this initiative that is being launched that is very exciting, which is about data sharing, uh, the concept that we would have all the data from every single patient out in the cloud so that everybody could access that information. Um, Pedro, why is data sharing important? Um, uh, and where do you see, how do you see uh, medical oncology will look like five years from now or 10 years from now? So what we've learned uh, from sequencing some of these tumors, we've learned that these tumors are very different. A number of genetic mutations and the combination of these genetic mutations in each tumor gives them a different characteristics. You need a huge number of, number of the, uh, patients and a lot of data to be able to analyze and understand exactly what is the specific effect of this one of these mutations. We've sequenced 10,000 patients. Each one of our patients are receiving 10 lines, 20 lines of therapy with different responses to each one of these treatments. Why just, you know, looking at this statistically, it's impossible even from 10,000 patients when we stratify it by all of these different cancer types to, to, to understand exactly what are the mutations or what combinations of the mutations are the ones that are responsive to treatments, the predicting response or resistant to each therapy. So for example, in breast cancer, we have 1,000 something breast cancer patients now sequenced. But we, when we're analyzing these data, we're seeing that it's, it's almost, you know, we, it's, we are underpowered. Even with 1,000 patients, it's the largest cohort of the patients metastatic disease have ever been sequenced. We're still underpowered. So then there is this huge need to combine all the data, all the cancer centers, all the multiple centers are doing the same. They're sequencing the patients' data, sequencing the tumors of these patients, and generating a lot of genomic data. And then, at the same time, we have these systems of e electronic medical records, you know, clinical trials. All of these patients have a lot of clinical data associated with this. So we have to find a way to combine this clinical data and genomic data and decipher exactly what's happening. The methods that we we, we've been using in statistics so far are probably too conservative for this type of analysis. We need to use machine learning. You need to use, you know, generate, you know, create much more creative ways of looking at this data to combine this clinical and genomic data together and understand exactly what are the predictors of response. So, they, so multiple centers, we have to put all of it together. Probably we're going to end up with 100,000, 200,000 tumors. Each one of them, multiple lines of therapy, response, no response. When we decipher all of this together, then we need a huge computational power to look at the markers and understand exactly what's happening. Yeah. And one initiative, and I'm finishing, that is happening here in New York, uh, there is the New York Genome Center, and we have a lot of meetings of the, with the different academic centers in New York City, and we are thinking of creating a cloud-based system 
so that we could learn from each other and have access to all these data. And I think that's going to be the only way going forward. Uh, it's time. Uh, uh, we've been talking for a long, long time here. So uh, I hope you uh, uh, got a, an understanding of our uh, field and why we are so excited. And I'd like to thank uh, both Pedram and Barry for, for coming here today. Thank you very much. Thank you.